Um, hello, mm -hmm. what, what time is it right now? It's 12, so good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I'm like thinking of time right now. Um, hopefully everybody is safe after you know, the storm yesterday, and hopefully I'm happy that all of you were able to make it here today safely. Um, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation today. So my name is Marisol Campo, and I am the Dallas Engagement Specialist for the ACLU of Texas. Uh, although, I, like um, as Mara recently mentioned, I also work for the ACLU of Wisconsin. The ACLU is a national organization. Does anybody know what the ACLU stands for? Yeah. Exactly, American Civil Liberties Union. And does anybody know how old we are? We're the second oldest civil rights organization in this country. NAACP is the first. We were born in the 1920s, so that makes us 100. So we are 100 years old. We are an old organization, and we have gone through many evolutions uh, through our history. Uh, we are a nonpartisan organization, which means we don't work with politically. We don't work for, you know, we aren't a associated with political parties. Um, and we are a nonprofit as well. We have an affiliate in every single state, Puerto Rico and DC, and we work on many issues that relate to civil rights and civil liberties. Here at the ACLU of Texas, we work on five main issues, uh, concentrate on them. Immigrant rights is one of them. Reproductive freedom is another, which will be our concentration today. Uh, LGBTQ plus rights, voting rights, and criminal justice reform, which we call our smart justice campaign. So if those issues, other than reproductive freedom, interest you, I welcome you to look at our website to see what other volunteer opportunities are available in those areas as well. So today I'm gonna be talking and focusing on reproductive freedom and specifically around abortion access in Texas, giving you a little bit of more context about what's going on here in Texas uh, with restriction to abortion and a little bit of history, both legal, uh, mean around legal and engagement uh, around the abortion, the right to abortion. So I do wanna just briefly preface that I am not a lawyer. It's very important that you know that. <laughs> so I am not a lawyer, although, as I said, I'm a Dallas engagement specialist, and my role in the ACLU of Texas is to engage community members, community organizations, um, around the five issue areas that I just mentioned. And uh, the goal is to push forward um, rights in these areas, defend the rights that we already have. So that's my particular position here in the Dallas area. So I wanna start off with framing the conversation around um, abortion. So I know that word can be triggering for some, but it's, reproductive health care for many. And, you know, we're looking at this graphic right now, and I want to just point out that one in four women in the United States will have an abortion by the age of 45. So that means that many of us love or know somebody that has had an abortion. Um, and sometimes that um, isn't public knowledge, right? Sometimes it's stigmatized for people, and so they keep it um, personal. But many of us know this, and we are related to this um, issue personally. I also want to say that, you know, women um, who choose to have an abortion, they will choose that, to, they will choose that right, um, no matter what the law says. And we see this through history, um, with many abortions that ha were led to people, women's death, or um, severely injured women, when abortion was illegal. And so the question here is, not whether women will choose to have an abortion, but how they will be treated if they do so. So let's take a look at who is having abortions in this country. So it might surprise you to know that primarily people who are religious are, ha are having abortions, about 62%, or people who already have a child. These people are usually in their 20s, uh, only 12% are teens, 4% of which are minors. And I also want to say that it's important to know that abortion is a safe procedure. 
it's often stigmatized and false information is spread about abortion, but abortion in comparison to, for example, procedures that people get very frequently, like colonoscopies, is a very safe procedure. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the misinformation that's being spread by the state um, and some of the restrict, uh, as an example of a restrictive law. So just so you know, close to 90% of abortions take place in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. And this will be important later because we're gonna be talking about gestational bans which is uh, banning abortion within a certain amount of weeks of a woman's pregnancy. And I do want to say that even though I'm referencing women frequently throughout this presentation, I also want to recognize that both trans and non-binary people also need abortions, and that those communities, we have less uh, information about those communities. Um, so I just want to make sure that that is recognized at the beginning of this presentation and that we keep that in context as we move forward throughout it. But these are just some information to give you context about what abortion is looking like here in the United States. So let's talk about abortion in terms of the legal context of it. So I'm sure who here, raise of hands, have, has heard of Roe versus Wade? Almost everybody, right? So this is the court case happened in 1973 that gave uh, people the access to abortion, the legal right to abortion. But there's another case that happened soon after called the Planned Parenthood versus Casey that happened in 1992. And what this did was it created the undue burden standard that courts used to analyze state restrictions on abortion. So once this case uh, went through the courts, once the undue burden standard was created, you start seeing a lot of uh, restrictive laws start being passed, around 400 laws passed in states around the country. So many more laws are being passed, um, and the question now is, what is an undue burden? How are we going to prove that these laws are an undue burden to abortion? Well, Another case went to the Supreme Court. It was called Whole Women's Health right here in Texas. Possibly you've heard of that as well. And this uh, case considered two restrictions that were passed. And what they were was that they required that the first regulation, the first regulation required that abortion providers um, have admitting privileges at a local hospital, right? And the second requires that abortion facilities meet the same standards as ambulatory surgical centers. So you may have heard that these two restrictions um, caused the closing of many clinics here in Texas. So we started off with around 41 clinics, and now we have 20. So just to show you how these types of restrictive laws can lead to serious um, consequences for access to reproductive health. So this case actually ruled in favor of um, saying that those restrictions were uh, an undue burden. And they wanted people to, their main message from that case was to look at whether laws are actually beneficial to women seeking abortions and what the practical consequences of implementing them would be. But it's important to know that, that those restrictions caused clinics to close over half of the clinics that we had in the state. And those clinics were not only about providing abortions, but they were providing all sorts of reproductive health care. And that happened in 2016. So we're going to go over types of abortion restrictions. All right? So this might be new to some of you. Um, you may have heard some of the restrictions happening here in Texas or across the country. And I'm going to give you some names and labels to, to understand them better. So, there are many. <laughs> so the first and the most popular of these restrictions are gestational bans, method bans, and trap laws. Currently, Texas has all of these. Right? So what are gestational bans? Um, I mentioned it earlier. This is a ban where abortion is banned after a certain point in pregnancy. Right? So for example, Texas has a 20-week ban. 
And this ban is currently being challenged in court. Ohio, for example, um, banned abortion after a, fetal, uh, a fetus's heartbeat could be heard, which is as soon as six weeks, which is usually, and it's women, many women don't even know they're pregnant by the six week point. So as you can see, there's a gestational ban is a ban on the amount of time that you can be pregnant before you decide to have an abortion. Um, Reason-based bans, they come across as progressive sounding and use progressive language because the point of the ban is to ban abortions based on race, sex, and disability. So you might think, oh, that's a progressive effort. But the true purpose of a ban is to create harder access to abortion and to ban abortion. So even though it takes on progressive sounding language, the purpose of this ban is to ban and make restrict abortion. Method bans are bans on specific ways to conduct abortions. And we will talk about that a little bit in depth in the next slide. Funding bans, you may have heard some commotion around this. The Hyde Amendment um, was passed by Congress, and this forbids the use of federal funds for abortion, except in cases of life endangerment, rape, or incest. So it's funding bans are exactly what they sound like. It restricts funding uh, for abortion uh, access. Um, another example of that is here in Texas, for example, Planned Parenthood and Title X funds. Um, losing those Title X funds um, for a national family planning program, for abortion access, and also the loss of uh, abortion and, and Medicaid. So it's loss of funding to fund abortion and other reproductive health care. Uh, TRAP laws stand for Targeted Regulation of Abortion Providers. And these are the laws that I previously mentioned in the Whole Woman's Health case with regulating abortion clinics and abortion providers and um, the consequences that come from that. So once again, it stands for Targeted Regulation of Abortion Providers. And we'll give another example of that in the next slide. Judicial bypass laws. Has anyone here heard of Jane's due process? Awesome, so we have a couple people who heard of it. So uh, judicial bypass laws is specifically targeted towards um, teens and minors. Um, who want to seek an abortion, they have to get uh, approval from their parents. Now, you might hear that and think, that is a tremendous amount of stress for that young teen, right? Um, and you're exactly right. So it is uh, a burden that is put onto that teen. I mean, it's already difficult enough um, with making that decision for yourself, that healthcare decision. But then it also puts the uh, onus um, well, it puts the decision of a medical decision, a healthcare decision, in a courtroom. And so what that teen has to go through is, if they do not want to get permission from their parents, they have to go into a courtroom and get a judicial bypass from a judge. So those are what judicial bypass laws are. And Jane's Due Process is an organization that helps teens access those courts, helps them get those judicial bypass laws, uh, judicial bypasses. So that's what a judicial bypass law is. It's targeted towards minors. Trigger laws, we'll talk more about the um, movement here in Texas and other places in the country for sanctuary cities for the unborn. But trigger laws are essentially laws, as soon as Roe versus Wade is overturned or banned, abortion is abandoned, they will go into effect. So that's what trigger laws are. They're waiting for Roe versus Wade to be overturned to go into effect. Um, and finally, religious refusals, which is pretty clear on what that is. Um, it is when physicians or institutions don't want to provide abortion or other health care, reproductive health care services because of their religion, and they receive no consequences for refusing to provide those services. So those are the different types of restrictions that we're seeing. Like I said, here in Texas, well, let's just go to the next slide. Here in Texas, we have many of those restrictions. <laughs> so here's a list of some of them. Like I said, the 20-week ban, which is a gestational ban, uh, currently being challenged in court. Dilation and evacuation ban, which is a method ban. 
And that one also is being challenged in, in litigation. And um, it's important to know that uh, dilation and evacuation, or DNE, is by far the most common and safest method to perform second trimester abortion. Right? So uh, even though it's a method ban, um, because they're banning a way to do abortion, it's also a gestational ban in disguise because um, that is the most safest way to conduct an abortion in the second trimester, and so they're basically saying you cannot have an abortion in the second trimester, right? So it's a, it's a little bit of both. Woo! Sorry. <laughs> Trying to wake everybody up today. Um, all right, so uh, we may have heard of the sonogram or the 24-hour waiting period after counseling. Um, and another trap law, similar to the regulations and restrictions we heard about in the whole women's health case, and this one might shock some of you, is that the state requires that providers hand distribute a pamphlet containing medically inaccurate and misleading information about abortion. And um, this is, I mean, there's a study done out of Rutgers University that found almost half of the statements in the pamphlet about first trimester abortions were false or misleading. And that's when about 90% of abortions happen is in the first trimester. And so people are receiving misleading and false information about abortions from their providers. So that is a law that currently exists right now. Um, in addition, it's important just to um, recognize that even though these restrictions are happening, it's important to know that it's making abortion harder and harder for uh, people to access, especially low-income people, especially in the counties where there are no abortion clinics or reproductive health clinics and services. There are over 200 counties here in Texas that fit in that description. So let's talk about um, in the legislative session last, uh, this past year and what happened there. So it can kind of be described in two different categories, anti-women's health and pro-women's health. So in anti-women's health, we saw three bills pass that uh, were further restrictions on abortion. SB 22 uh, restricts local government from partnering with abortion providers or their affiliates. Right? So this might sound like, oh, but what's the big deal about that? Right? Well, it further reduces and restricts uh, people's access to reproductive health care. An example of this would be in the Valley, in the Rio Grande Valley here in Texas, Planned Parenthood partnered with uh, different towns. The towns would pay for Zika kits, for example, and Planned Parenthood would then distribute uh, Zika kits and condoms, and Planned Parenthood would then distribute those items. And so it was a partnership between the town and Planned Parenthood. Something like that can no longer exist anymore. So you can see how that's affecting uh, people's access to uh, reproductive health care uh, beyond abortion, right? Uh, SB 24 is the second one up there. And this one is uh, phrased as women's right to know law. So you m I just mentioned about those pamphlets and the inaccurate information that's conveyed through them. Um, well, this, uh, one of which, for example, is that abortion increases your likelihood of breast cancer. Uh, false information that's being propagated. And it makes it harder for doctors because they have to give this false information now multiple times. So that's what this uh, new Senate bill does. They have to give that information multiple times now. Um, and HB 16, um, which is called the Live Infants Protection Act, um, this one is a, has a very interesting narrative to it because uh, what it does is it criminalizes doctors and subjects them, subjects them to extra layer of scrutiny from an attorney general if an infant is born after an abortion, a lie, okay? So you might think like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Um, but it's important to know that once we started, uh, we started taking statistics on whether infants were born after abortions alive in 2013, and not a single infant has been born alive since we started taking statistics on this. So it's important to know the context of that and to know that this particular uh, house bill is trying to create a narrative that there are infants being born alive after abortions. Beyond that, it subjects doctors to criminal penalties 
and it created an anonymous hotline. So anybody can call this hotline and put um, information out on a doctor, for example, and that doctor is then subject to investigation. So you can imagine how that can create more barriers for providers who are willing to provide those services, and now they have all of this extra worry and stress about possibly being put on an investigation for an anonymous tip. So those are some of the anti-women's health uh, legislation that we saw this past year. Some of the pro-women's health um, that we were able to pass. Um, we, have a, we had a lot of um, gains for women in jails and prisons. So um, you may not know that there are pregnant women in prisons and jails, but they definitely are. And these women were being treated pretty horribly during their state of pregnancy. And so House Bill 1651, House Bill 2701, and House Bill 2169, those all fall under the first category. These increased health standards and training and uh, banned shackling of pregnant women, which we were definitely still doing. Um, it required jail staff to be trained on how to probably care for a pregnant woman. And it required jails to have appropriate feminine hygiene products on hand. So none of this was necessary beforehand, and now it is. So some pretty large gains in the reproductive freedom um, issue area and movement. So there, I want you to also know about Marlise's law and Rosie's law. Now these two laws did not pass this time around. But I want you to know their, their context because there's still very much uh, effort that's ongoing. So with Marlisa's law, this was a law that's based off of a woman named Marlisa Munoz. And she was an individual who had put in her end of life care that she did not want to be kept alive on machines. She suffered a pulmonary um, attack, some type of problem with her pulmonary, uh, her lungs and lost oxygen to her brain, so she went brain dead while she was pregnant. And so because she was pregnant, the state said that the hospital must keep her alive. It refused to listen to her end of care wishes um, and her family's wishes, which were to respect um, Marlisa's wishes. And so they kept her alive like that for 62 days, um, including um, you know, billing the family for all of the health care that they were giving Marlisa. So finally, the family was able to um, get a court order to um, respect Marlisa's wishes, and they were able to do that. But this law would um, make the state respect women's wishes, people's wishes, for their end-of-life care, regardless of whether they're pregnant or not. So that's Marlisa's law. It did not pass this time around. Rosie's law, Rosie's law is um, about abortion fund funding, and it's based off a woman named Rosaura Rosie Jimenez, who died seeking an abortion in the Rio Grande Valley due to the Hyde Amendment. And the, the Hyde Amendment, we mentioned it before, was the taking away of federal funds to um, fund abortion, except for those three instances, right? So she died trying to seek an abortion. Um, and so this particular law would provide abortion coverage for low-income Texas families enrolled in Medicaid. Right? So that's what this one would do, and that one hasn't passed yet either. Has anybody here heard the news about the Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn? Yeah. Anybody else? What about if I said Wascom? And maybe you saw that picture of all the older men sitting around the table because they're all like older white men who all voted to ban abortion. <laughs> Did anyone see that? Yeah, that picture was pretty, um, it was shared pretty widely. And so Wascom was the first. Um, and essentially what this movement or this effort is, is to ban abortion at the local level, at the municipal level. Um, and more than just what you might perceive as an abortion, they're also considering emergency contraception such as Plan B as an abortion. So that is banned as well. So um, on top of that, there's, they are you know, trying to ban information, just talking about 
abortion, providing information about abortion as, as uh, something that to be criminalized as well. And so you can see that these types of bans are very, um, uh, criminalize many things around abortion, um, stuff that you might not even consider as an abortion. Um, and it started to sp spread to other municipalities. So we're starting to see it in Wascom, Gilmer, Naples, Joaquin, Taha Tenaha, Omaha also recently, these are all places in Texas. Omaha also recently passed an ordinance and then changed it to a resolution. Mineral Wells, which is a little bit past Fort Worth, maybe some of y'all have been to Mineral Wells, was also thinking about passing a res uh, an ordinance to ban abortion and there was uh, a big public outcry against it and the city council was not able to pass it. So, it, this is, can, can be considered as like a trigger law because the bans will go into effect if Roe versus Wade is overturned. Right? So that's what we're kind of seeing. And they're using, you probably have heard of sanctuary cities before, but in what context? Immigration, exactly. And so um, that's usually seen as like a progressive movement. And so you can see a, um, a co-opting or a, use, a usage of progressive language in um, a cause that's trying to take away rights from uh, people and reproductive health care. So this happens quite frequently. So um, what can you do about it? Well, actually, so I brought a slide up to you today because access to reproductive health care, um, not only federally, but also statewide and locally. And so um, the ACLU of Texas here in Dallas, as well as other cities in the, in the state, are part of a coalition called ReproPower. Um, you can find a website online, ReproPower Repro Dallas. So as part of this coalition, and the coalition is formed of other repro health um, organizations, as well as the ACLU of Texas. And our aim is going to be to um, grow access and rights in the repro healthcare, um, reproductive freedom. So in that sense, we are planning to start ramping up uh, local uh, efforts. And so if this is an issue that you truly do care about and you want to see um, reproductive health care be a right that remains um, for people here, I strongly recommend that you sign up um, because there's going to be a lot of energy around this issue in the, f in the near future for this. Uh, also, it's an opportunity to uh, engage in our legislative work in the future. I also want to briefly mention that we, the ACLU of Texas, host a Reproductive Freedom in Action Conference, or RFIA, and we hold it every year. This year it'll be in spring of 2020, or um, probably in March on a weekend, so on a Saturday. And we don't have the exact date yet, but we're pinning it down. And this is a conference where mainly graduate students and young professionals attend, and they are educated and um, uh, informed on how to be reproductive freedom advocates in their respective fields. So um, some, some of them come from law, some of them come from healthcare, and they have an opportunity to meet each other and meet other reproductive freedom advocates uh, from the ACLU of Texas and other partnering organizations. So it is a great opportunity to really get more informed. This presentation times 100. Um, get really more informed and a really fun way to meet other people that care about this issue. So if you're interested in that, I also recommend signing up. 
Here are some more pictures from it. Um, some, some of my colleagues, there's a lot of uh, workshops that you can choose throughout that day and some efforts that you can actually take, like some actions that you can take that day as well. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, this is my contact information, my email up there. So if you are interested um, and have a question that you don't get to ask today, please feel free to email it to me, okay? Um, but yeah, I'm going to open it up to question Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much.